Please rise. Yeah, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, on whom the Holy Spirit has been poured out in the abundance of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. A deist is someone who believes that God exists. And that he even created the world, but that thereafter he left it to fend for itself. As if he were some kind of parent who gave neither mind nor matter to their children. Pays no attention to them, nor bothers to care for their needs. But God is no deist. He is not far removed, estranged, uncaring about the troubles on earth, nor bothering to work in this world. God comes down even as we saw in our text from Genesis 11. I wonder what those sons of Adam are up to, God said. He came down. Of course, he didn't have to come down. He didn't even have to wonder. Yet our text specifically says that God came down to see. That's it for our benefit. To emphasize that God is no deist. He comes. He is imminently working in this world at all times and in all places and cares about all the things that his people are doing. He must have known that they'd be up to no good there at Babel. They were Adam's children after all. Can't leave them alone for very long. If you parents can remember times like that where you think, uh-oh, I haven't heard from my kid in a while. They must be up to something. And it seems like they always are. And they were Babel. They had big plans. We can do anything, they said. Just think what we can accomplish if we work together. This is a great place to build a city, they thought, and I suppose at least in that respect they were correct. They were in the land of Shinar, modern-day Iraq, the cradle of civilization, the fertile crescent, so I suppose it was a pretty good place to build a city. And they thought they had everything they would need there. Bricks for stone, bitumen for mortar, and of course good old human ingenuity. Just think what we can accomplish if we work together. Let's build a tower up into the heavens. The sky's the limits. We can do anything. And that's precisely what God was afraid of. See, no one knows better than the Creator what lofty heights the might and minds of man may reach, particularly when united. And the trouble is not what great things they can accomplish, but what sorts of things they set out to accomplish. You know, that age between one and two, it's got to be one of the most terrifying years for a parent, right? The child is old enough to be able to walk, pull, grab, stumble, touch, kick, all sorts of things, but not old enough to be able to make any kind of reasoned decision about whether it's a good idea. You can't ever really leave them alone. You can't seem to ever take your eyes off of them for very long because they're always proposing to do ridiculous and harmful things. Now imagine that as the child grew and became capable of doing more and more, they simultaneously also failed to grow in any kind of ability understand what is good or right or safe. Suddenly every year becomes more terrifying than the last. Now maybe some of you are thinking, hey, I've seen that before and it's called a teenager. But God had something far worse on his hands than a teenager or a one-year-old or a one-year-old teenager. He had sinners. He had the sons of Adam. That's literally what the Hebrew text refers to. These sons of Adam, God said. See, when man fell into sin, what he lost was not his abilities. He didn't lose his ingenuity, or his brains, or his brawn, or any of the manful gifts which God the Creator had given him when he crowned man as creation's king. What man lost was truth, and righteousness, and holiness, and wisdom. What man lost was what made him good. And consequently now, nothing that man proposes to do is ever good. It might be impressive. It might be bold, it might be grand, like a tower up into the heavens, but it is not good. Because the thing that man continually comes back to is to reach up into the heavens and to make me. I, I even saw it on a shirt this last week. A young man was wearing a shirt that said, Only God, me. And the very fact that a member of our race could make such a boldly idolatrous and blasphemous statement proudly is pretty stark evidence against 
the corruption of all of us because of our sinful nature. The tower that they were building there it was probably a ziggurat intended for some form of pagan worship. And yet what they were really doing was making a monument to man. It was man making man, man's only God. And man knew it. Listen to what they said. Each man to his neighbor. Come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered over the face of all the earth. Why would they be afraid of such a thing, to be scattered over the face of all the earth? It was not that long ago when God said to Noah as he came out of the ark, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. At Babel, they knew exactly what God wanted them to do. And it was for that very reason that they did not want to do it. They feared God's will and hated their creator. And so it has always been with man. Ever since Satan's first successful temptation, as he said to Adam and Eve, come. God doesn't want you to eat that fruit because he knows that if you do, you'll be like him. And he's just selfish. He's doing the best for himself. And ever after, we humans, Adam's children, all of us through and through, fear God's will because we think that he designs evil for us. And that's going on faith. They didn't want to be scattered over the face of the earth if for no other reason than simply this, because it was what God wanted. And so they united opposition to him. They reached up in the heavens and attempted to give themselves the creator's crown. And what about you and me? When we use the ingenuity, the brains, and the brawn, and the abilities that God has given to us in our daily vocations, what do we use it for? Who do you use it for? Whose name do you seek to exalt into the heavens? God's or yours? And when you hear God's will and word, how do you react? Do you say with the psalmist, oh, how I love your law? Or does Abel's paranoia still fester in your heart? Causing you fear and hate God. Well, the answer for you Christians is both, isn't it? You're saints and sinners at the same time. And so according to your sinful nature, you do fear and hate God. And when you hear his word, you immediately want to do whatever is the opposite of what he wants you to do. But at the same time, in faith, according to your new man, you hate your sinful nature. Repent of it and beat it with the whip of the law. And turn to God in faith and repentance and love. But the trouble at Babel was that there were no saints. Or if there were, there certainly weren't many. At Babel, the unbelieving world was united in opposition to God. It is no wonder then that ever after the term Babylon in the Bible becomes used as a metaphor for the kingdom of the devil. For all unbelievers united against Christ and his kingdom. Yes, unity can be good. And man can accomplish some pretty remarkable things when they work for it. But the trouble is, that unbelieving man always proposes to do things which are in direct violation to God's will and word. He does things for himself. He does things to make himself his own God. And so the more man is united, and the more that we accomplish, and the more great and the wonderful things that we do, the more dangerous we become to ourselves. Like a nuclear reactor having a meltdown, the pressure building and building ready to explode. But that is not to say that it was God coming down because he was afraid that man might harm him. But they might actually be able to rip him to reach up into the heavens and pull him down from his throne. No, he who sits in the heavens always laughs at man's attempts to dethrone him. They united to be scattered. They proposed to be one people with one nation and one language and one tongue and God in a moment put a stop to that. They thought their tower was so very high and impressive but, you know, here's another reason why it mentions the guy came down. It had come down to see it. Oh, what's that little tower you built down there, sons of Adam, that you think is so great? One moment, each man was speaking to his neighbor, and the next, they couldn't understand each other. Can you imagine how weird that would be? Especially because before this, there had not been such a thing as different languages. In fact, when the text indicates that there weren't even different accents. Same language, same words. They all spoke the same things, and they spoke them in the same way, and they all understood each other perfectly clearly. And then suddenly they don't. You know how 
annoying it is when you call a company and you get customer support and the person has some thick accent, you can't understand what they're saying. And you immediately begin to get annoyed with that person and begin to get suspicious of that person. That, that's what we do, right? But when we can't understand people, our simple nature tends to begin to fear them. And so through confusing their languages, God caused man to fear one another even as they feared him. Their unity was fractured and they were scattered on the winds to every corner of the globe, through all the face of the earth. On that day, God came down. Because he's no deist who sits afar off while his children destroy themselves. He came down to judge them, lest their pride destroy them. He came down to scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts. On that day, God, and not man, was God, and that was good. Because another day would come. A day which served as a bookend to this day. A day which in so many ways would be the opposite of the day of babbling. For when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The apostles, that is, not their forefathers in the plains of Shinar. And they were there, united, not in opposition to God, but obeying Christ's command. And they were there, not in Babylon, but in Jerusalem. The apostles came together, and on that day the Holy Spirit was poured out from a high in fire, just as Jesus had promised. On that day, God came down. Not to scatter or shatter or confuse, but to unite and to do it right. You know, sometimes we have to destroy something in order to make it the right way. That shelf, for instance, out of the darkness, the black one. I put that together a few years ago. And when I was done, I realized that I had done it wrong. The top was on the bottom and the bottom was on the top. But I didn't want to start over. Yeah, you know, I had to tear the whole thing apart and, and start again. And I didn't think it was that important. It's the sort of thing that my old landscaping boss would have come over and torn it apart and said, you did it wrong, start over again. And so was God. God came down on, at Babel to shatter the people and scatter them. Not because he did not want men, mankind to be one, to be united, but because they were doing it wrong. And the way they were doing it was going to destroy themselves. They were united in opposition to God. Because remember, whatever man proposes is sin, is good. And so man proposes, and God disposes. But God is not just some big medium who poops any ideas that man has and then doesn't have anything constructive to add. No, God destroys, and he also builds. And that's what's going on on Pentecost. On Pentecost, God the Holy Spirit comes down to build a city. Not Babylon, but the new Jerusalem, the bride, the beautifully adorned for her husband, Christ Jesus. In that city, all the nations scattered at Babel are united as one. On Pentecost, people from every nation under heaven are confused again by language. But not because they suddenly can't understand their neighbor. Rather, because they suddenly can understand the apostles who are speaking in tongues as the Spirit gives them utterance. And what things they are saying... Not declaring the great aim of man, but the mighty works of God. God, the Holy Spirit, came down on Pentecost to shatter sinners of pride and rebellion, to convict the world of sin, to convict you and me of sin. He came down to proclaim Jesus Christ. He who came down from the heavens in mighty stride, sent from the Father to shape the heavens and the earth. He who was made a son of Adam to redeem the sons of Adam, to be the good that we are not. He who made himself of no reputation, no name, so that he might be given a name which is above every name, so that you might be able to call upon his name and be saved. He who is lifted up from the earth on the cross in pain and blood and suffering as an innocent sacrifice for the sins of the world, so that when he was lifted up in his ascension in glory to the right hand of God, he might be your head, you, his body, so that your head might really be in the heavens where God is, so that he might be your pride and your joy and your glory and your name, the name which was placed upon you in baptism. The name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The name above every name. The name on which you can call in every trouble. The name by which you are saved. The name of the manger. The name of the blood, and the cross, and the grave. And now, the sky. This is the only name which the Holy Spirit proclaims. And this is the name in which we are one. 
for this name, we all speak the same language. The language of sin is forgiven. Of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God and Savior of the world, we speak the language of the creed of one Lord, one faith, one hope, one birth. And whereas at Babel, God came down to scatter people to every corner of the earth in order to keep their pride from destroying them, now God the Holy Spirit began to spread His people to all the face of the earth. So that in every language, in every land, and in every tongue, he might speak the one language of the gospel. So that he might gather for himself a city, truly united, a city in the heavens, white and radiant, beautifully adorned in the blood of Jesus Christ, by the blood of the Lamb. A city truly and completely unified, whose name is Jesus, whose hope is Jesus, whose joy is Jesus, who knows nothing about Jesus. But the Holy Spirit knows and preaches nothing but the name of Jesus. There was only one right way to build a city. Only one way to have true unity among men. And it was not man's way. So man, so God came down to scatter them. But right after he scattered the nations to every corner of the earth, he also enacted his plan to unite them once more. You see, the very next chapter of Genesis, the very next thing that happens in the biblical record is that God chooses one nation. He calls Abraham and he says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation, and in you and in your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So it was. For from Abraham came Jesus, who when he was lifted up on the cross drew all people to himself, he ascended and so the Holy Spirit descended at Pentecost to bring that unity, the unity of faith. And the Holy Spirit still comes down today just as he did then. He comes down to convict you and me of our sins. He comes down to break us of our pride and our rebellions. He comes to plant in us a heart of faith. He comes to baptize and to preach. He comes to make us one in Christ. He comes to speak one language, the language of the gospel, the message to your sins are forgiven. And in that language, we are all united. For it is that language which unites us with the Father. And it is that language which unites us with each other. That language which removes the bitterness and the hatred and unforgotten wrongs which we hold against each other and all the annoyances and fear and paranoia that come from our sinful nature. The Holy Spirit comes to say, you cannot go up to God so he has come down to you, because he is no deist. And the Holy Spirit comes so that through his church, the gospel is still proclaimed in every tongue. In every pulpit around the world, where this gospel message is preached, there the Spirit speaks his one language, the language of sins forgiven. And just imagine, imagine that you are in a room with, with brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus from all over the world. From India speaking in their languages, and from Nepal, from the Raju, and speaking in Nepalese, and from Peru, and Mexico, speaking in Spanish, and from Germany, and Australia, and, well, Australia speaks English, it's a ridiculous example, but from Germany, and Japan, and, and Africa, and they're all speaking in their own language, and you're all saying the words of the truth. You wouldn't understand the specific meaning of the words, but you would well understand you would well understand what they were talking about. For you would all be speaking the one language of the Holy Christian Church. The one language which the Holy Spirit speaks. For he knows only one language, and he lives up only one name, the name of Jesus Christ. And he builds only one city, and he has made you a part of that city. And so now, in your daily vocations, in your daily lives, and all that you do with all the ingenuity and brawn and brains that God has given to you, and in all your relationships, do not seek to lift up to the heavens your own name. And do not fear and hate God. Rather, let your tongue be the tongue of the Spirit, which speaks the language of sins forgiven. May God, the Holy Spirit, continually come down to us, as he did on Pentecost, to make us one. One more, one faith. One hope, one birth, one city, one name, and one tongue. Amen.